Hello. Hi. Let me start by just discussing um, the next the homework I set. I mean, my idea is that the um, final activity in this class will be uh, choosing an AI, uh, choosing an area where AI is impacting, making big changes, uh, describing that, and hopefully identifying a piece of software which is indicative, at least, of the methods used in that area. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily the alter, an alter software that makes progress in that area. So as an example I gave was um, one of the students, I think, uh, was did uh, the stock market using uh, LSTMs. Well, you can find lots of software on the web which uh, tells you how to use LSTMs. And so that would be an example. Um, and if you find that the, the, the thing you chose last time was not really what you want to do, I told you to go and redo another area, which might be what you would like to write the final project on. And then I'll adjust the following homeworks to, to the people who are one week out of phase, because they, instead of developing the software, they've um, um, found a new area. Are there any questions about that or anything else? I did have um, one question, and this might be a me problem, but um, I saw that the grades were released. However, mine are still um, invisible when I check on Canvas. Is this, has anyone else had that? Maybe I forgot to publish them or something. I will check on that. <laughs> I did enter them, but maybe there's another button I have to press. Oh, yeah, it says the instructor is still working on the grades. And I know in, in a class that I'm one of the TAs on, there's some, um, you know. Well, let me see if I can. Releasing them are different. Now. Um, yeah, I'm not, I say I don't use Canvas very much, I, but I do need it for grading. So. Um, Let's log into Canvas. Assignments. So here we are, grades. Actions. Did you see your previous grades? Uh, no, uh, none of them are visible to me. So nobody can see any grades? I can't see my grades either. All right, I will have to see what I did. I mean, they appear on Canvas to me. Maybe there's a magic of parameter I have to set to make it appear to the students. I, I will look, I will leave that window up so that uh, after this class, I can look at it. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions? I apologize for that. Somebody should have complained earlier. <laughs> if not, I will continue with these application discussions. We were about okay. two thirds of the way through health and medicine last time. All right, this was the last slide we did last time on digital therapeutics. And um, 
here is the next slide. And what I added actually on the bottom of these or somewhere in the most of the many of the remaining slides, my estimate of what type of um, deep learning network might be used in these different areas. Uh, using a relatively naive um, um, assignment of algorithms with uh, image base, they're going to use convolutional neural nets. Most database lookup using use fully connected networks and text related uh, methods use um, LSTMs and transformers and things like that, sequence to sequence methods. And uh, if you look at this page here, um, well, we have insights claimed from the patient DNA. Now, I may be doing this in injustice, but I don't think there's a lot of um, deep learning applied to DNA at the moment. I, mean, I, I think I mentioned already, if you look at all the early progress in, in bioinformatics was actually in genomics. And lots of sophisticated machine learning algorithms were developed in genomics, but that was before the deep learning revolution. And I don't think huge numbers, significant numbers have been uh, of those uh, early methods have been changed to deep learning. But mapping, deep, mapping I mean, the, the deep learning methods that does mapping of, of uh, specifications of things to their properties, which is sort of what this uh, adverse drug reactions is, that's typically done with a fully connected network. So that's why I added fully connect work connected. Fully connected network here. Here we have oncologists looking at cancer, which must be image based. A lot of it is image based. So that's convolutional neural nets. And here we have IBM Watson, which is a text analysis system looking at the world, <coughs> the world's information on um, in books and on the web. Well, they're now probably everything on the web. And um, that's using various natural language processing technologies plus probably fully connected networks to, to get final results. All right, so here we have just a variety of techniques in customizing medicine using a pretty a really wide range of um, deep learning methods. I mean, that's actually a feature of medicine. It has mm -hmm. a wider range of uh, deep learning methods than other fields, because other fields tend to focused on one particular method, like autonomous vehicles are focused on um, on uh, con concurrent, I mean, convolutional neural nets. Uh, ride hailing is are focused on uh, recurrent and graph neural nets and things like that. All right, here's a fun one, plastic surgery. So here we are, we're mapping, um, we have to map people's faces into a better face. And uh, here we know that um, probably GANs, which do the, uh, which produce um, these um, fake images are pretty useful. And maybe also fully connected networks to um, actually do that mapping from, to decide which plastic surgery method is the best method. And other it's, and all finally, um, uh, the um, CNNs will be used presumably to analyze people's faces and see, find out which, uh, which appropriate tool would be used. But I haven't actually studied AI for plastic surgery. Well, this is actually an old slide. It's a year old and it's completely out of date because it's actually discussing the start of Fitzer and Moderna, who were the two earliest uh, produced um, <clears throat> um, vaccines. <clears throat> and they certainly used uh, machine learning and almost certainly deep learning to try to map the properties of the uh, virus into appropriate drugs. And um, I've, uh, there's another couple of slides later on, which points out that and then one, and you were, one of you discussed this in the, in the uh, homework, how drug discovery is being really reinvigorated with deep learning. And I, I, I think I probably told you in 2010, I went to an NIH meeting, which shut down the project we were working on because they were so depressed by the progress in um, 
um, so-called cheminformatics, which was the method of mapping chemical specification to chemical properties. But that field has been totally, we didn't do that, we, we just give, gave up. But the field in the last uh, five years has been totally revolutionized with deep learning. And that's sort of what you're doing here, because a drug is a chemical, you're trying to find drugs with the right properties. Well, here is uh, just an example of what probably isn't AI. I only put this in because it involved Kushner, who was a brother, whose brother was um, part of the previous administration. And I suspect this, I mean, this is actually true of some of these slides. Some of them are not really AI, they're IT. And as we look at the digital transformation, some of the transformation is going to be basic IT, and some of it is AI, and uh, not, and uh, and we actually need all of them. You can't do um, AI without some IT, innovative IT. Um, well, here we have uh, yet more on this drug discovery process, and. Um, this points out it typically takes six to seven years. And um, this involves, and now as I pointed out, deep learning maps molecular structure into drug properties. That's the cheminformatics uh, activity, which has been totally changed. And I've also pointed out to you, I think before, that this is exactly the same as used in, um, in material science, where you can map material properties into the the features of whatever the metal or whatever they're making and therefore um, help the manufacturing industry. The other aspect mentioned here, which is what my friends uh, and Department of Energy do, which when they run their chemical simulations on um, large supercomputers, they use uh, deep learning to make those chemical simulations more efficient. I have a slide later on about that. And those use a variety of different techniques, including autoencoders and fully connected networks. The fully connected networks allow you to map the initial simulation into a final result. The autoencoders allow you to identify so-called collective coordinates so that um, you can find out uh, which combinations of parameters of the simulation are most important and use that to accelerate the progress of the simulation by, as these are largely done statistically, by enhancing the statistical sampling. So here is um, a plot of some sort of paper I found about uh, the uh, timing of, um, I mean, the various uh, stages of drug discovery and um, it does show, um, if you look at 2010, when they turned off our program, it was looking pretty depressing, but there's been some dramatic improvements uh, of recently. And it's got much, I'm sure it's got better recently. Um, this is the probability of success. So it's increasing. And of course, that's the purpose of the deep learning methods. They're meant to narrow down the, uh, the uh, feel of the number of ca ca drugs that you have to look at uh, by looking at by an, an initial filter. And then once you've done, filtered out and got a few drugs, you can then look at them with experimental methods to see if their properties are really what you want. This was the method that, this is my co colleagues at Argonne and Brookhaven National Labs, DOE Labs who have done a, a lot of incredible work in this era in the last year on molecular dynamic simulations to simulate the actual uh, interaction of the, the drugs with the um, with with, uh, with proteins and uh, <clears throat> and they use uh, these methods in uh, in uh, to in these two stages one is this uh, identifying the trajectories and things like that. And this is this uh, collective coordinate stage. It's just making the whole molecular modeling uh, um, system much faster. 
And then you have something like docking, where you're trying to decide which, um, how the protein, how a drug will uh, in, hook up to a protein. And that's probably done with a fully connected network. Whereas I mentioned these ones here are done with autoencoders and other networks like that. So this uh, type of simulation has been revolutionized by these two methods. And I'm not quite certain what the total factor is. It's somewhere between maybe the, at least 10 and sometimes a hundred or a thousand times speed up. Of course, there are a lot of drugs, so you need that speed up. Um, so here we're looking at the response to, to mutations where there are a lot of possible mutations. Uh, here are a few remarks on digital twins. And that's, I'm, all right, so this points out that there is a sort of um, interesting property of deep learning, which I think could become more important. Namely, you can think of uh, deep learning as a, because the deep learning learns the model. So the model is essentially the physics of the system or the, or the theory of the system. And so if you look at uh, many things which are, need to be explored, they are what I would call a complex system. Now we have a giant activity on campus devoted to complex systems. But when I talk about complex systems here, it's, a, it's consistent with that what's done with that center, but slightly different from what they focus on. Uh, the idea is if you look at um, what you have to study in the world, um, and you go say to the supercomputers run by DOE and NSF, most of them are uh, simulating um, systems with entities like atoms or molecules or quarks and things or stars where you believe you can know how to evolve those systems using Newton's laws or the Rack equation or, or quantum field theory or whatever the appropriate theoretical description is. But there are a growing number of, of um, simulations done which are done as so-called complex systems. And a good example is um, simulating the interaction of, of um, a virus with a, um, um, with a human body, that is so complex, you can't do it in terms of the molecular dynamics. You have to have generate some equations for the virus and some equations for the cells and use those to study the system. And so a complex system is one where we don't know the fundamental physics of the problem because they don't have a fundamental set of equations. They, um, to have a ma an empirical or phenomenological description. And I see deep learning as gonna have growing importance in complex systems and complex systems themselves are hugely important. There is something which um, industry loves called, it's why I entitled this section digital twins, called a digital twin. And the digital twin is a simulation of your, whatever you're doing. And uh, like one of you, Anna, I think did marketing. Well, marketing is a system which involves the interaction of marketers and consumers and things like that. So a digital twin of a marketing system would involve, would not be, a, you couldn't use Newton's laws to, to plan it. You would have to use empirical laws to see how that would um, evolve. Um, so, and the same is true in what I do on earthquakes because earthquakes, although if you get to, in all of these physical, these complex systems, if you go to small enough scale, they are, you do see Newton's laws or Schrodinger's equation or what have you, but you need to study at a larger scale. In the case of earthquakes, you have to study it over the entirety of Southern California. And although the faults in, below Southern California obey the laws of physics, at least we assume they do, there's no reason to believe they don't, you can't, you don't know enough about the um, boundary conditions and the, and the, and the makeup of the earth to be able to solve those equations. 
And uh, pandemics are also a complex system. So earthquakes are complex systems. You have to study them empirically from the concept of a fault and, the, and uh, to see, to understand them. <clears throat> And, but then, the, but we have no theory of a fault. So what I'm trying to do is to train a deep learning network to understand what a fault looks like. With pandemics, you have a similar issue. Um, you have an interaction between people, viruses, um, policies, transportation systems, and the, the spread of the pandemic depends on, on all of these. And you ain't, you're not going to be able to solve Newton's laws to, to predict that uh, evolution, but you can, well, uh, usually in most of many complex systems and digital twins, you use so-called agent-based systems. Agents are the things that represent the members in the complex system. And the, I, what I said for pandemics, people, people, cars, um, aircraft, et cetera, parties, they're, com they're the uh, agents and agents act with other agents, and then you write down those rules, um, such as if two people agents come together for 15 minutes at a distance of less than, I don't know, 10 feet, they have a probability of such and such to, to, to transmit the disease. That's a, effectively Newton's laws for pandemics. And you just apply that iteratively. Um, <clears throat> So you can do this two ways, either with these physics-based models, that's actually how most people do pandemic simulations, or you could do it probably with deep learning. <coughs> Although this particular use of deep learning is only just starting to get um, um, much use. Um, you, can, you could uh, consider transportation systems as a wonderful example of a complex system. The agents are the cars and the drivers, and they live in a world defined by roads and things like that, and the weather. Uh, one of the earliest works, which I once worked on a long time ago, in fact, my earliest work on parallel computing, which is, was on parallel computing for so-called war games. That was the so-called strategic defense initiative where we were trying to understand how to track uh, incoming missiles. And uh, all war games, which involve interactions between war fighters and people and planes and bombs and things like that, they're always done with agents and there's lots of sophisticated software here. And again, those are almost certainly addressable with deep learning. But this is just starting. Well, I think I've already said that. Um, and I just want, and again, I stress here, complex systems are not random systems, but just systems subject to unknown laws. And that's why deep learning is, uh, or even machine learning is interesting because machine learning learns the model and it has hidden variables. It learns the hidden variables by looking at the, the, the big data produced by the system and that big data gets mapped into the hidden hidden variables, which are describing the, the um, dynamics of the complex system. And I pointed out <coughs> why I stress deep learning is that um, uh, it learns the model. I told you why I think deep learning is so important is that it, you don't have to put in a model. Whereas for almost everything else, you have to put in some variant of a model. Um, so, um, so the, but the alternative, which is actually pretty active, especially at IU in some areas, is modeling. And that's what I used to actually do when I, I worked in uh, understanding the interactions of, of fundamental particles when they collided at huge energies at accelerators. Uh, I mentioned that work earlier. Um, there you to make a phenomenological model for what's interacting. In this case here, this, this page is describing the, the interaction of viruses and human cells 
And um, here we point out the cell has 10 to the 14 atoms and, and the virus 10 to the eight. So we're not gonna do it from fundamental principles, but we can do it as a complex systems. Um, and you, can, you need to build the model of the virtual tissue, the model of the drug. And of course, then this relates to computational epidemiology because it, you're gonna feed the results of that simulation into the simulation of the people spreading the disease. And these different mutations and things, mutations and things like that. Um, so deep learning could actually replace the agent-based simulation and, um, or it can just be a part of it, namely, um, for example, I just worked with the group, group led by James Glazier to develop a deep learning method to, to enhance the simulations that we're doing. So I'm not replacing the simulations. There's more like uh, what I described that people were doing in molecular dynamics of using deep learning to allow that molecular dynamics to move faster in time by finding collected coordinates. Another thing to do is to just take parts of the computation, which are particularly hard, and um, use deep learning to build a much an efficient approximation. And if you're really ambitious, you could imagine joining everything together. So you go from the, uh, you know, the ventilators and beds in the hospital and the diagnostics through the policymaker, the people, um, exchanging viruses and this uh, viruses and cells interacting together. So that's a giant complex system. And uh, so I would say this is, this type of picture is sort of what underlies a lot of AI first engineering. Um, it's not done terribly sophisticatedly at the moment, but um, the use of digital twins and AI enhanced digital twins or AI developed digital twins is clearly going to be uh, uh, really important. This is a slide I did a year, uh, six months ago on um, areas where you could actually choose topics in COVID-19, I really, I think we discover discussed most of these in the last in aspects of the last slides. We have the COVID tissue interactions, which I was just studying, the epidemiology. Uh, there is a lot of um, AI necessary to, in the devices that people will wear to detect that they're ill and things like that. Those are gonna be time series, which will need a particular type of deep learning. I mentioned the importance of chem informatics and computer simulations. And also uh, it, there's a, the, lots of AI in the telehealth area, which we, I think we discussed already. Because med the medical, I mean, it's a good complex, one good complex system is the health system of, the, of any one kind of anyone, either of the world or of any country. You can see with COVID, it didn't work so well for the health system of the world. But um, all of these are uh, areas that can be studied and they have AI, both in simulating them and identifying things as to, to make them work better. So these are the last few slides I collected together from my, old, my initial slides. Uh, here was a slide uh, earlier, it was actually, which believe this lady from New York University um, claims that Apple, Google and Amazon are, um, are playing more and more roles in the US healthcare. And um, that's not terribly surprising because Google, Apple and Amazon, and if you would, let's add Facebook, um, have the huge fraction of the great deep learning and AI staff are working for them. And um, given that we believe, I believe deep learning will be a major weapon in, or major tool in, in driving change in healthcare, in health industry, it's um, 
pretty likely that these companies, if they're allowed to, I mean, there's going to be a lot of antitrust issues and um, maybe there's some good reasons to break the power of these companies, but the fact that they're willing to put the AI people into addressing important problems outside their main domain is actually hugely beneficial. The most obvious example of that is the work of Google's DeepMind unit on AlphaFold, which was discussed in one of the homeworks, homework answers uh, by JU, that um, AlphaFold was an example of a study of how deep learning to understand protein folding, which is relevant to drugs and, and actually life itself, because folded proteins and what, how you build life. Um, and they just had, the, they beat every single other group, including the best academic people, because the academic people just don't have the resources. They don't have the number of AI experts that these other companies have. Here is um, the, the list from this um, website I took it from. And I listed over here, uh, what here were the, these various opportunities like um, electronic health rep record market disruption. Well, probably a lot of that is just doing IT better for that field. But, and, and, but um, and that's probably a lot of this is fully connected networks to interpret uh, e e EHRs, because EHRs, or well, if you look at the basic EHR, it does not have images in it. Of course, once you add images to it, you're going to use uh, convolutional nets and things like that. We men they mention uh, telehealth here. Well, that's um, going to be convolutional networks will be used there to interpret remote images. Um, Chat boxes are mentioned, while well, those are going to be natural language processing based deep learning using methods like transformers. They mentioned Apple Watch and Fitbit. And um, those will be time series with their current neural nets and transformers and things. And uh, they don't mention Alpha Volt here because it didn't exist when this slide was made. But that's probably a fully connected network at its heart. Well, here is again just a comment on AI and diagnostic medicine. And um, those are going to be a mix of fully connected networks and um, convolutional nets for interpreting either the text and the generic data or the um, image data uh, produced in, um, in, um, by healthcare systems. I think this is the last slide of this set. And I kept it in. It's not terribly relevant. It just points out that the, over, the, over the last year, we Uber has become a, a, a food delivery as opposed to a, just a ride handling a taxi system. And if you look at Uber's technology, it is very sophisticated and deep, deep learning because they have to deal with transportation systems. And that involves graph and recurrent neural nets. A pretty different set from the previous ones we looked at. All right, I think that is the end. All right, that's the end of that set, that uh, those set of slides. Do you have any questions on health and medicine? I would say it's by far the richest area in terms of number of different methods which are useful and the number of different ways of applying them. I think you touched on this in an earlier uh, lecture about just the interpretability of, of findings in deep learning. Um, and, and I guess one of the things I was finding when I, was, when I did the other homework on, on drug discovery was uh, the hesitancy, I guess, of the industry to, to maybe adopt a deep learning approach because they 
don't necessarily uh, follow how the network actually arrived at that decision. Uh, I don't know whether you might have any any other. Things. Well, I I have pointed out that um, that uh, the we see is best seen from the case of Tesla versus General Motors. New technology is hard to inject into large existing companies, and uh, what you see is often startups developing the new technology. And then the, the existing companies just buy the startup. And um, probably General Motors could have bought Tesla at one stage. They should have done, obviously. Although maybe that would have destroyed Tesla if they did that. Um, so I don't, I think the number of successes for deep learning is so huge, I don't believe they can be ignored people, the companies that ignore them will not succeed. Um, the, the only issue is, I mean, it's clear deep learning can't do everything and, there, and also there's some many areas we have not yet explored, but um, it has had a huge impact in the areas it has been used in. And it's so promising, in my opinion, that it's uh, we're going to see it um, more and more focused. Now, I don't think companies would ignore it. I don't see how they can. If you can discover a drug in a, a tenth of time using deep learning, well, well, you have to do that. You can't compete otherwise. Like with COVID, they found the drug in a few months. And uh, I think when we start, when COVID started, I don't think people actually thought you could do it that quickly. I think the uh, drug companies, it's, uh, Moderna and uh, J&J, they excelled in, in developing these drugs quickly because they're so non-trivial to develop. Although probably they used experience from previous, previous flu flu virus uh, vaccines. But um, certainly the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were incredibly effective. I mean, they were 95% effective, which I think is actually high for a flu vaccine. I don't think flu vaccines are that effective and they are typical. But of course they have much more data and a much greater reason to try to improve the effectiveness because without a highly effective vaccine it would still it will linger on for even longer well, we don't actually know how long it will linger at the moment but um, it's clearly um, so I, I think it's well I mean at the moment it looks as though the USA will be vaccinated by mid-summer or something other countries won't I feel, you're from Nigeria is that right I doubt if Nigeria will be vaccinated by then but uh, um, I'm actually from Zimbabwe, but uh, yeah, I, I guess in, in, in Zimbabwe, actually, they have been getting the, you know, the, the, the vaccine from China, and I, I think they've also talked to... Because the, the Chinese vaccine, although China did much better on the COVID case statistics, their vaccines are not as, appear to be as effective as the American, as the... European and American ones, because the, uh, the ones from some of these are, I'm not quite certain, Pfizer and J&J &J are giant multinational companies. I don't know, if, I think Moderna is probably a US company. And we know Astra, what's it, there's one, Astra something or other, which worked with Oxford University, which comes from the UK. So there is one which is therefore purely European. But they're quoted, um, effectiveness of those vaccines is greater than that of the ones from China. I'm surprised actually, because China knows everything. So as I know, they ought to know whatever we know about. I mean, they have more effort in AI than the US does. Maybe not the same effort in companies, but the government support of AI is stronger in China than the US.
Okay, any other questions on health and medicine? Anyway, I think it's a good area to study um, uh, AI in because it's um, incredibly important and there are many, many uh, success stories which I'm sure will get even better. And I point out there's one, there's one area I noted where I think there's going to be, there ought to be a lot of interesting things to be done combining genomics with deep learning. Because genomics was all the early successes of bioinformatics. And so it developed all these methods before deep learning was, was understood. All right, so let me move on to a small short presentation on space. All right, I assume you can see my uh, space uh, space presentation. Correct. All right, so space is actually an industry where probably AI is not the dominant reason it's thrived. I think in these, in these small number of slides, space is really exciting and um, made a lot of progress, but a lot of it is just been by supplementing NASA with uh, private industry. Um, and here is at least some of the areas where um, uh, space is uh, supporting AI, which is the, um, so here's where space provides technology that makes AI better. It is the global navigation system uh, the Earth, uh, Earth observing satellites, and also communication systems. All of those certainly have AI. Uh, and whether, as, as I mean, and satellites, satellites gathering image data on the Earth is actually pretty similar to uh, drones trunding over the Earth at uh, just a little bit above it, and will produce some. Um, images which will use the same method to analyze them. Here is AI supporting space. Um, and there is, to it, and of course, this, uh, actually the, the area which is really the bullet without any body, which is, um, which really means uh, that space uh, is, um, important for, for um, AI is important for space is that most of the things in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in space are autonomous vehicles, you have autonomous rockets and uh, autonomous spacecraft and things like that. And uh, you can also see that with Perseverance, which just landed on Mars. Uh, this is an autonomous rover with a, with a actually a little little ingenuity which is a drone that uh, you can release and presumably AI is built into those systems um, and it can it, it can use the same type of technology control technology that uh, um, self-driving cars and things do it. although of course dry, flying in space has different challenges but still that just means you have to train the systems differently. Um, so there's the general control problem, which is what is caught here to let telemetry, telemetry and control. Um, there's lots of images produced in space. Perseverance is producing a bunch of images. And um, it also points out that people are probably going to try to do manufacturing of space that will have to be controlled remotely with AI. And also, um, at least if you, especially for the, for the uh, spacecraft to go to Mars and go into the, into the uh, far from the Earth, 
their main, a lot of their problem is they don't have enough bandwidth to transmit their results back to Earth. And so uh, choosing the right way to do that, either to avoid interference or to maximize, minimize power use is uh, an AI application. But as I said, probably, <clears throat> If you look at most of the news in space, Perseverance, I believe, came from Jet Propulsion Lab, which I'm pleased to see as I used to work there. And uh, in fact, I worked on the original, a little bit on the original Mars, um, Mars rover, the first time was put up uh, in, on Mars by, um, um, by JPL and got wiped out by the uh, storm a year or two ago. Anyway, Clearly, SpaceX and other types of um, um, commercial endeavors are very, very prominent these days. And uh, it's sort of striking that the same type of um, attitude that's led to all the money which produced AI startups has also produced actually space and when we look at energy, energy startups and also fintech or financial technology startups. An enormous amount of money has gone into startups in these areas. And it claims here and through 2019, it's uh, $25.7 billion with the amount going up year to year. Um, here is a summary of this money. Um, so we actually, I mean, through the claim, you know, it sort of has a simple model that um, through 2009, it was all NASA and the government. It did produce these companies like um, Boeing or Lockheed Martin, which was supported NASA, but they weren't very entrepreneurial and they didn't innovate. The innovations came from the National NASA laboratories, uh, Goddard, JPL, um, the Johnson Space Center and things like that, Langley. And then around 2009, there's been a huge growth in uh, this number of the yeah, entrepreneur, what's called the entrepreneurial space age. And you can see in this nice graph here how the investment is uh, grown dramatically. And this is a plot of both the money, which is this one here, and the number of companies. And those companies are broken up into categories, which are shown by these different colors here. Um, the largest category is satellites, $12.3 billion. And then this launch, which is $12.2 billion, and so on. This is a pretty interesting um, picture. Um, it points out that there are 2,200 satellites, at least uh, around um, end of 2019. And um, <clears throat> that's out of 9,000, over 9,000 launched. But if you look through the end of 2029, there's expected to be 57,000 satellites launched. And I recommend looking at this YouTube picture here. It'll probably kill me to, to... It's not what I meant to do, I'm sorry. Anyway, this is the satellites going around the Earth today, or roughly today. And you can see a few ones out in, uh, towards the edge of the diamond. These are in high Earth orbit, and then a huge number in low Earth orbit. And um, which are the, the, the easiest to, to use for um, local operations, internet and things like that. And you can see it's getting pretty dense. Um, 
All right, so I'll let you watch that that um, video. But it is impressive how many satellites there'll be, and how dense they are. How I mean, it says that uh, the you know, and even now there are quite a few satellites. So if you could just see them uh, running around, you know, running around where anybody is. But that number is going to get really dense as we uh, move on to the fifty-seven thousand number. All right, we managed even to get back to our to our part to our Google Google Slides. Um, this is, in my opinion, not. I mean, the less of the last slides. Uh, yeah, there's some obviously the AI is used in various uh, opera, uh, various parts of NASA, um, and um, I don't think these are particularly. All right, sorry about that. I was a mistake. I should not have tried to show a YouTube. YouTube does too many things automatically. Like choose, use a deep learning based recommender engine to choose which which video to show after the one. It was actually a good video to, to suggest one on perseverance. But um, anyway, I didn't want to hear it. And uh, there's some examples here. One, and this is actually this example here at the bottom of the malfunctioning sensor, where effectively they used um, uh, deep learning to to learn how to predict uh, the results from a defective sensor by you by training a deep learning network on the time when the sensor was working so you could then feed in the results of other sensors and then there's going to be a correlation it's likely and there was a correlation between the defective sensors results and the sensors that still work and so you could train the network to actually replace the sensor that's actually actually a pretty interesting idea how you could uh, Increase the uh, number of observables you get, because you could take the you could then actually deliberately switch off sensors after you've got a bit of data enough to train your neural net, and then you could um, save power and put that power into other things or making the satellite or the rover last longer. So I think that's a sort of amusing application. Um, you can no longer see your slides. Ugh. That was a huge mistake, wasn't it? I will not share a YouTube again. Now you can see it. My connection's been spotty, so I thought that was just me. <laughs> Well, all of this will be put on, uh, on I mean, I, this is being recorded, so I will put this on uh, on, on YouTube as usual. Um, anyway, oh, so this is the missing slide, but I already said most of the words here. So um, um, here is an example of how they used AI to uh, take partial data and use it to make a full 3D, 3D reconstruction of the shape of an asteroid. And um, there's meant to be some pictures of the results of that AI technology. So again, this is a mapping um, the partial data into a 3D model, uh, training it on existing methods. All right. I think that is the end of the uh, of the discussion of space. Any comments on space? But space is certainly going to give us lots of images. The world is going to be so full of images, with drones and satellites and 
self-driving cars and things or security sensors. I'm sure there's a challenge in trying to understand how to, um, how best to, uh, order to process this because we can't keep reprocessing it. You better process it and then, and then get the answer and then throw the data away because there's too much data. It can only be looked at automatically. It can't be looked at by people. Um, all right, so let's try to um, share this last one on. We still have time. We'll share the last one on energy. And if you look at energy, energy has some revolutions which are due to uh, ah, fine. rubbish. Energy has some things which are, are due to AI. It has a lot, it has um, other things which are just due to money. Like in the case of space, um, a lot of the progress in space is just learning how to build cost-effective um, rockets and things like that. And the money went into that area, which uh, AI has a secondary, secondary uh, consideration, but interpreting all the data from those satellites, uh, AI will have primary responsibility. All right, so here we have a, um, um, well, comment about energy, and this is meant to be uh, a comment actually, which was used negatively in the recent Texas um, power outage that um, we're going to a complex world where the electrical grid, which used to just collect uh, connect together a few giant power plants is now going to connect together a huge number of small devices, wind turbines, electric uh, batteries in your self-driving car and say so your electric car and so on. And um, it's part of this, and part of those developments are due to the trend to clean energy. And uh, they're going to produce uh, challenges and opportunities for AI. Um, so this sort of summarizes uh, um, some issues which clean energy is uh, raises for the uh, for AI and in general. Um, one is that you have to be able to cope with um, the time dependence of wind and solar energy. So you have to have a large amount of management issues to try to make certain you can store the energy when for when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. And uh, maybe, uh, you, and um, you might and use them uh, and use that for when it's uh, uh, calm weather and dark. And uh, the, the role of AI, this is a, Optimization problem and the AI is certainly is just an optimize is the best way of doing optimization. So it's very relevant. It's more directly relevant with dis distributed systems. Um, uh, because of, um, we have a lot of small scale energy resources like uh, solar panels on the roofs of houses, uh, smaller wind, wind turbines and things like that. You also have distributed storage. I mean, as they get more and more electric cars, most of the energy in the world maybe will be existent in the batteries of these uh, cars. Um, and this is, you know, we talk a lot about edge computing. Well, here we have power at the edge. And they're gonna be associated with, with computing at the edge because these uh, edge tech, edge, so uh, edge uh, power systems will need edge computing systems to transmit, uh, receive control information and to transmit information about that power situation to some smart uh, system. Um, and 
the whole, the, 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 I remember I studied, Gregor and I were at Syracuse University once and one of, one of the power company there was called Niagara Mohawk and we studied um, electrical grids using early, uh, com early computing technology, so-called parallel solvers to, to try to look for instabilities and things like that. But th that was a case and in, in that, that was, um, when was that? That must have been 1995 or so. And at that time, there were, no, there were not edge technologies for PARD. Everything was uh, you know, hydroelectric or, or oil or coal PARD. But so the power use of IT to study power systems is very old. But what's changed is that the problem has become much bigger and actually more interesting because you have a much wider variety of power systems. And if we saw in Texas, things can go down probably in a more complicated fashion. And um, so I, I would, the problem of looking at the AI and IT for electrical power grids and electrical power systems is getting more important. And one of the, um, one of the questions is how you, uh, how, whether you use distributed or centralized energy. Um, and um, there is a uh, 2016 article on that from uh, Caltech and the DOE lab. And uh, this issue between, I say there's sort of interesting analogies between um, energy grids and computing grids. Whether you should do like in computing, everything is, uh, there is actually computing at the edge, but most of the hardcore computing is done in clouds, which are at the center. And that choice of clouds versus edge is an important choice. And uh, at the moment, clouds are dominant, but many people think the edge will get more important. And um, we'll have to see uh, that. So we have the same questions in this, in this world we're living in everything is becoming a host of small systems. And you can either put all those small systems together in a central cloud, that's what a, putting 100,000 computers in a single data center is, or you can put those 100,000 computers in 100,000 different places. And you have the same formal power, but the ones which are in the, on the edge have two, one advantage, they're on the edge next to what's ever happening nearby it, they have one disadvantage, it's much harder to coordinate them with the other, with the other 99999 computers that you didn't put at that particular edge position. Whereas if everything lives in a single cloud, it's much easier to manage them in a centralized fashion. So, you know, again, this is a resource management system, which is an optimization system, and that's AI again. Um, this was a claim that, which actually one of the one of the uh, homeworks had, uh, looked at, which um, claims that California should increase its use of um, distributed uh, energy sources. It certainly should try to avoid uh, energy distribution systems which catch fire, and. Um, it points out here this um, interesting idea that um, you can use electrical cars as a um, storage place for energy because they have their batteries can store energy which can be used in other things. And here we have our community park and um, with uh, solar panels on the roof of the, uh, of the shelters. And here we have another example of this very small distributed uh, system with this lady who is, um, has an electrical wheelchair, an electrical car, and some solar systems on her roof. Actually, not so many. I mean, it's sort of a, quite a small microgrid. And of course, you can use her personal energy. So she can take her car, store the energy in this battery, and they use it to run 
to run her um, wheelchair and things like that. And this was a study which I didn't look into, but here's, uh, I have a, if you go to the slides that are available, it has the link to this report by McKinsey, which says that um, a hybrid solution where you mix centralized energy with this um, grid-based edge energy, actually in 2022, the distributed solution is more efficient. Um, so, and they actually not, and then they actually cost less for the consumer. So that is an interesting model where you use the uh, national grid and with the large power plants to fill in the gaps from your, in your local system. I had a, pl a plot of um, uh, <laughs> investment in space, if you remember rightly, it was $25.7 billion total. Well, now in energy, we have just in 2019, 10.5 billion. And if you look at this plot here, it must average 6 billion a year since about 20, 2006. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's about 100 billion. And um, that's, so there's a hundred billion dollars have gone into clean energy, which, and you notice that this is, this interest of venture capital in these non-traditional new areas is it's sort of remarkable. I don't think people emphasize the importance that venture capital has had on, on the world. They pied a lot of, a lot of what's important. I didn't realize till I got some of these numbers here, uh, how critical venture capital was. Um, so there are, there are the most of the rest of these slides are particular examples. And um, th this is a one example called Form Energy, which has, the, the, I will show you pitch book. Actually, I, 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 yeah, pitch book should be safe. And it's a quite, got a quite interesting set of, um, of um, descriptions of companies. And this form is not an AI company, it is a battery company. And if you again look at energy, and energy has some AI issues, but a lot of them are not physical um, technologies to make things better, better batteries, better ways of making manufacturing, which, which produce uh, less pollution and so on. And it has a battery made of bricks where it stores the energy. Here's one I will, I think I'd, I'd finish on fusion because fusion has some very nice uh, deep learning examples. You know, fusion has been, it's sort of interesting that I, I, you know, I like, I work a lot with people with um, the government national labs. JPL I worked for for a while, which is NASA's uh, space lab. I work a lot with the Department of Energy. Now the Department of Energy spent a fortune on fusion. And uh, with, um, with, some with some commercial support, but they found it very difficult to make progress. But just in the last few years, there have been a set of startups in the fusion area and their investments, I suspect are quite small compared to DOE's investments. And um, they've um, put a hundred million into this company, Tokamak Energy, which is from the United Kingdom. And um, it's sort of interesting that these companies could succeed where the the entire national, in, actually it's an international effort because the Tokamak, which is where you uh, have, you produce, the, where you make the fusion happen, they have a giant new international machine called ITER, which is in, in Europe. Um, and um, so that's sort of interesting that these people could be competitive. Um, so, 
Uh, here's a little comments about fusion, and then the last slide will be one about um, uh, deep learning and fusion, were a pretty interesting problem. So fusion involves deuterium and tritium, and um, has to occur at a long, high pressure and high temperature. And um, as they say, a tokamak is a, usually a hollow bagel, and you have the gas running around in that bagel, and uh, which is called plasma. And those plasma, the electrons in that plasma are guided by magnets. And uh, eventually you manage to concentrate everything to get, uh, to get fusion. Um, now tokamak energy is, and they've got an innovation is using a spherical tokamak, not the donut shaped one. And it's been working in this area for over 10 years. Now, let me finish with this uh, last bullet about stability. Well, if you're running at 100 million degrees Celsius and huge pressures, you probably ought to, you need to be a little worried that there's not some problem. Like we know that the spacecraft sometimes explode. The last one from SpaceX exploded. Also, tokamaks can, um, they, they don't think they explode, but they uh, have destructive um, instabilities. And um, so you have your electrons running around in the, in the plasma and they can become unstable. And uh, if they're unstable and they, in, a, in the wrong way, they can damage the Tucker map, which takes six months to mend. And uh, my friends at Princeton who work in, the, in their, um, in the few, they've worked on fusion for many, many years. I've given some links here, how they, generated a, a network. I told you how for molecular dynamics, we can use networks to optimize the progress of molecular dynamics. For the dynamics of electrons in a plasma, we can use deep learning to monitor the behavior of those electrons and see when an instability is likely to occur and produce and single that, produce that as a signal in real time to the control systems which will then change the parameters of the plasma to stop that instability destroying the tokamak. So that's pretty exciting. And the slide I'll finish on today come is a, comes from the Princeton Deep Learning paper, which was published in Nature. You can see it's got a pretty interesting network. It has convolutional networks, because if you think about this, um, this donut, I mean, this, this is using the bagel-shaped uh, tokamak, so it actually has images at any one time. The, uh, you can take an image of the distribution of electrons in the, in the bagel. And so it has convolutional nets mixed with uh, recurrent neural nets. The LSTM sits here at the bottom. So this is an interesting example of a hybrid network with both uh, recurrent and convolutional networks together. And they say they train it on the observational data. You could also train it on simulations, but this is trained on observational data, which allow you to, you just say, all right, this configuration of electron densities leads to a, leads to a instability 30 seconds later, or doesn't lead to a instability. And, um, it's a pretty inspired, a pretty interesting paper, it seems to me, because it's illustrative of deep learning in the large scale instrument control system, which is a little example, a little related to the digital twin idea and quite important in my opinion. All right, I'll leave it there. Are there any questions? No questions? Send me an email if you have any questions. I'll process this and uh, put it on the on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The homework. Um, I don't really get what we're supposed to do for the second part. The very latest homework. Uh, assignment four, yeah.
Well, the latest one is assignment five. So let's look at assignment four. I Let me just bring it up on my other screen. Oh, so this is the one about combining networks. And I gave you an example of a combined network where you take a fully connect, sorry, a hybrid network where you take a fully connected network and follow it with a recurrent neural net. Um, but you can do many other, many other combinations. And the question is just to choose another combination, uh, produce a network that has that combination. You can even just reverse the order. You can do an LSTM followed by a fully connected network and then run it to see how well it performs. Okay. And do we also, do you also want like timing? Well, you'll automatically get timing, right? It's more interesting is probably performance. Okay. Uh, by timing, I mean, if I think it's important to look at the accuracy and see if the hybrid network has higher accuracy than the individual networks, which you probably should will. Okay, so if I wanted to use like another data set, then like a completely different data set, then can I do that? Yes, you can. Okay. I just want to you to learn how to use these uh, layered structure to compose a custom network, because that's effectively what one does in making neural nets and for real world problems. You choose you choose a set of layers and join them together in different ways. Okay, I think I know what to do then. Any other questions? Uh, okay, thank you. We'll go offline then. Thank you.